I'll start. Um, yeah, hi. My name is Robert Layton. I'm having technical problems. Um, <laughs> I got a new laptop and um, that it was not recognizing that there was a, uh, another screen attached to it at all. Um, yeah, so I'm here today to talk about text mining online data with scikit-learn. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, I did turn this into a slideshow, but we'll not do that for now. Um, so that was my abstract. Um, so who am I? Um, thanks for the intro. Um, this was, uh, I was going to talk a bit more about this, but um, yeah, I'm a research fellow at the at Federation University of Australia, which was the University of Ballarat and the Gippsland cam campus of Monash until the first of this year. Um, there I work at the Internet Commerce Security Laboratory and um, basically I look at cyber, cyber attacks and try and work out whether the same person did the same, uh, whether two different attacks were done by the same person. A lot of what I do is working on text. So um, my PhD, for instance, was on analyzing phishing websites, trying to find artifacts within the source code and determining whether those artifacts mean that the same person probably wrote both of these uh, phishing attacks. Um, so I do uh, a lot of research with text. Um, I'm a scikit-learn contributor. Um, if you've used the DB scan, I wrote the first bit of that. Someone improved it, but um, I wrote that first. Um, and, um, and this year I'm mentoring a student for the Google Summer of Code uh, for scikit-learn on um, locality sensitive hashing. So basically making a more scalable uh, way to find nearest neighbors. Um, now, this presentation, um, I put these up here because um, uh, two reasons. First of all, to show that uh, everything here can be done with Python 3. So I think the days of the incompatib incompatibility, at least in the scientific Python stack, in um, our documents into their words. Um, and then for each document, um, we have a feature so, such as, say, X or, or say the first column, and that feature corresponds to the same word. So for xi, it will be the frequency of that word in the ith document. For xj, it will be the frequency of that same word in the jth document, and so on. Um, and the bag of words model is pretty much just that uh, count of how many times each word appears in each document. And um, this is called the bag of words model because basically we get rid of any sort of grammar, any sort of um, assumptions about how the sentences are formed or how the words relate to each other. We just throw all the words into a bag and we just count them. So we don't care about wh what order they appeared in. Now this is a very crude model, but what we find is it works. Um, and, um, and it works quite well for a large number of cases. And scikit-learn has a count vectorizer class, which will do this for you. Um, the count vectorizer class, um, by default, will use word, um, word uh, frequencies and, uh, and give you a bag of words model. So in this line here, um, in this line here, we define a new count vectorizer. And in this line here, Uh, I believe um, that's a, um, again a Christianity and atheism um, term. So um, what you'll typically find is that um, for a large portion of words, the Christianity and the atheism frequencies will be approximately similar. They're talking about the same thing, but from different angles, obviously. Um, so we've trained our model, and um, and I just realised these. That should be up there, but um, because we've already fit our model on our training data set, we can then use that to transform our testing data set. Now, this is the data set that we left till the end. Um, so we want those column uh, features, uh, those those columns, to match exactly the same as in our data uh, training data set. So we just do a transform here, and that will use our previously learned dictionary to make sure all the columns match up. And um, and from here, we can take out um, our matrix representing the training uh, doc, uh, documents and Y train, which is the categories that they're in, and put them into a support vector machine with no parameters, just the defaults. 
um, and then and then that f we fit that model. Um, and this basically get, tells the support vector machines do its magic, find out um, the certain boundaries that support vector machines have. I won't go into too many details about how that works. Um, that's a whole another presentation. Um, but basically, we just fit a learning model around that around just the training data. Now we use that fitted model here um, to predict what was in our test set. Um, so you can see here it it is only given the um, bag of words model for the documents. It's not given what's expected, what the expected classes are. It's designed to predict that. And this is the F pred or F prediction. Um, and we can see here that um, the F1 score, um, we calculate that and it's 0.527. Um, as I said before, the F score is related to accuracy and generally wherever you see an F score, you can think in your head, oh, the, that's roughly the accuracy. Um, it's not, that's not a very correct thing to say, but it's approximately right most of the time. Um, but I'll just put the accuracy there because um, that comes in handy later. Um, so yeah, so we get, for three classes, we would expect the random chance here to be about 0.33. So our bag of model, words model does much better than chance. Um, there's a whole line of research that goes into getting this figure up um, uh, that you know works on different parameters and stuff like that to try and improve this uh, performance. But we can see just with the defaults, we do a reasonable job. And this here is just basically everything we've talked about, um, but just in one handy script. Now, um, the next step is, um, I had a very cool um, Batman word cloud here. So if anyone wants to see that later, just let me know. Um, yeah. Um, so, uh, so the next uh, example is spam detection using Twitter, uh, or spam detection on Twitter. Um, as I said before, I do a lot of um, cybercrime stuff and, um, and spam is a big problem. Um, first of all, it's annoying, um, but also it's a vector for crime, whether that's um, spreading malware, um, sending you to illegal pharmacy shops um, where who knows what's going to happen to your credit card or your body after using one of those. Um, and as well as that, um, it basically, um, it, it can actually cause significant um, damage. Um, in Australia, we see spam as being a nuisance, but if you can imagine yourself in a island in the middle of the Pacific where the whole country's bandwidth is very limited and 80% of the emails going into that country are spam, you're actually causing significant economic damage to the whole country by using up a whole country's pipe to send your crap. Um, so it's, it, it's a big problem. Um, so for Twitter, um, Twitter has a big spam problem too. Um, you could probably argue that most stuff on Twitter is spam, but there is actually um, actual spam in there as well. Um, and I said uh, I said here that um, uh, here that spam detection is generally a pretty easy job for a human, but in Twitter it's a bit more difficult because without context. A lot, of, a lot of tweets are actually very short and mean absolutely nothing without the context. Um, you know, they might be replying to a tweet or be part of a contest. Um, and as well as that, when I was going through and labeling the data set for this, um, I saw, there was a whole bunch of tweets that were contest related, you know, like who's your favorite MTV star. And um, if they come up in my Twitter feed, I would consider those spam because I'm not participating in that contest at all. Um, but for someone who is participating in that, con uh, in that contest, it's actually what they want to see. They want to see how their um, artist is doing. Um, so it's, it's an easy job generally for, for me to do it to my, for myself, um, but to actually determine globally what spam is not always that easy. Um, thank you. Um, so here we just load the data up. Um, in our data set, a hundred um, spoilers. Um, we have a hundred uh, that are spam and three hundred ninety-eight that are not. Um, so we have that unbalanced data set that we were talking about before. And um, 
this is exactly the problem that accuracy is not good at evaluating. Um, so if we use exactly our script bef as before, we, um, we fit a bag of words model, we use that to fit a support vector machine, we use that support vector machine to um, predict our test set. Um, we get a F score of zero um, and an accuracy of 78.6. <laughs> Um, so if we only measured accuracy, we, we think we'd done quite well, but um, this F score by default um, only looks at the positive classes, so only looks at what we've actually labelled as spam and only evaluates based on that. You can change that, but, um, but by default it only looks at the positive. Um, and we can see why um, by using uh, this classification report. Um, for things that are not spam, Whenever we, well, basically what we did here is um, we always got our not spam and we never tried with the spam. So all our classifier here was doing was just saying everything is not spam. Um, and it did quite well. Um, um, so we can fix this by doing some parameterization and um, Basically, uh, with this cell here, I've done two things. The first is introduce um, some parameters. Um, but first, um, I've set up a pipeline. Now, a pipeline um, is a standard thing in machine learning because you often have input going into one algorithm, the output of that input to the next algorithm, the output of that into the next algorithm, and all these transformi uh, transformizations, including normalization, um, you know, our bag of words, which takes text documents as input and gives you a matrix as output. Um, even support vector machines can be seen as a transformer where it takes a matrix as input and returns a vector as of predictions as output, but, um, but that's, uh, that's handled separately in a pipeline. So basically a pipeline is just a list of things um, that, uh, that fit the transformer model of taking one thing as input and giving a different thing as output. It'll, and it will do what I said before, input, input into one, output as input into the second, output as input into the third, and keeps going until it runs out of models here. And we also name them uh, so that we can say later that we want the vectorizer to have uh, values for this uh, specific parameter, and here is a list of uh, things for that parameter. That's probably not a good example, but here, um, we have our vectorizer, the min df, and we want to try values of two and three for that. Now this parameter here is the minimum document frequency. So we want to say here, we will only include features that occur in at least two documents. And this gets rid of a whole lot of um, things that only appear once in the document and are never going to be useful for um, classification. But what, um, what the most important thing in this um, uh, model is, is the engram range. So an engram, um, actually one step back, with spam on Twitter, just from a bag of words model, it often looks like non-spam. The words themselves are used everywhere. Spammers are very good at looking like normal messages. Um, that's their job. Um, so when you actually look at the individual words and their frequencies, um, uh, they, they actually have this similar frequency distribution. Um, but engrams make it harder um, to, to uh, fake that. So an engram is a subsequence of n consecutive tokens in a row. So when we're looking at words uh, we, and n is, say, 2, we have two words in a row and we use that as our feature, not just the individual words. And we still use this bag of words model. So we, we grab our engrams and that's a feature, but then we don't give any other context into where it occurred. We just see how many times this feature occurred. Um, and we just do that count across the whole lot. Um, I've also introduced the analyzer here because there'll be a different later, thank you, um, difference later, but it's word. So we use our n-gram range of one, which is just one word, what we did before, up to three. Um, and this will do um, combinations of one and two and three, um, all in the one model. Um, and these are parameters for the classifier, but I'm not going to go into those in this talk. Now, with our pipeline, 
and our parameters that we've set up, we can, um, we can use a thing called cross-validation, which um, basically um, does what we said before about taking a bit of our data away for evaluation purposes and training just on a bit. Um, I'm going to very quickly skip over a lot of the detail, but basically we do this a whole bunch of times with the, with the different testing data set. So we're still within our whole training data set. We haven't used this bit of data that we took away at the start. We're still within our training data set, but we take a little portion of that to just evaluate a little one attempt at a model. And we do this a whole bunch of times. And basically what um, Grid Search CV does is it um, uses all possible combinations of all of these parameters, tests them all out under a cross-validation framework, which if you're doing machine learning, you really need to be using. Um, and, um, and it will tell you which, the best, which is the best model. Um, so we, this itself is a classifier, which um, means all we need to do is fit on our training set, and it will go and do all this cross-validation, testing all possible combinations by itself. It will come back maybe a little while later um, and give you some predictions. Now, these are the predictions on the best possible set of parameters that GRID has found. So it's gone off, tested all these models, chosen the best one, and then used that for prediction. Um, and it, um, so based on the small number of parameters that we define up here, which for machine learning is quite small, um, uh, it does quite well. Um, if we have a look here um, at our, um, at just our span predictions, w what the precision means is when we said something was spam, we were right 80% of the time. And when something was actually spam, we got that correct. Like we actually found 59% of the spam in our whole data set. Um, and these are basically just calculating the F-score based on that. So the F-score is a combination of the precision and recall. Um, so that's uh, detecting spam um, in Twitter. Um, the next um, application I'm going to quickly go over um, is related to my research, which is on determining the author of, say, a, a program based on attributes only within that program. So, um, so how we, what we do here is we get the source code of a whole bunch of different uh, so software. Um, we train a model very similar to this one, um, but instead of using words, we use characters. Because what we find um, both in natural languages and in programming languages is that um, words are not very good for picking up authorship, but characters, which are just you know one C and one E, character engrams are very good um, at doing this. And the reason they work for natural languages is that people often use words that they can say. And, um, and while you know, a lot of people here might have learned English at s approximately similar times in school, in approximately the same areas, the variances in how you learn language dictate what you can say and dictate how you write. And those little differences can be mapped in a frequency in a similar bag of words model. And, um, and we can build a model using this sort of bag of words model, using support vector machines or even simpler models, and we can predict the author. Um, so I don't have a working example of that, um, but I just thought uh, we'll go over that, that that is a thing that um, can be done. Um, another example, which hasn't come up properly, but um, is uh, trying to predict someone's political stance based on their social media um, profile. And um, basically this research uses a much more complex model based on the LIWC corpus, which basically takes these words and gives a whole bunch of extra information. So where before I said that the bag of words model discards all this extra information, doesn't care about it, um, this uses that bag of words model with a whole bunch of extra information such as when this particular word is used in this context, it means this. Um, so um, so it, go, it goes a bit beyond semantics. So semantics basically means when someone uses the word bank, it could mean a financial institution or it could mean the side of a river. We use semantics to work out which one they meant. Um, but with LIWC, it adds that with a whole bunch of extra context information. 
Um, yep. And that was perfect timing. So, um, so yeah, so those are my two other examples. Um, so um, thank you for listening. And uh, sorry about the technical information, but we got there. <laughs> so we've got about... One minute of questions, and then we'll have Redwin go. Uh, you can quickly set up now. And this is the cup. Oh, thank you. I can't speak as get. Uh, questions, anyone? One qu or two questions, right? Good. Thanks for that. <laughs> oh, there's a USB still in it. Uh, Robert, uh, if you can uh, explain, uh, can it uh, do more uh, clever like uh, in the in the context of uh, semantic rather than uh, only individual words sorry could you repeat the question uh, when you categorize uh, uh, the the data can it be b uh, more clever that it can uh, categorize it uh, categorize it uh, based on uh, semantics rather than just uh, words yeah so you're asking if we can use semantics in the bag of words model for instance or just generally generally yeah, yeah you can definitely use it generally so um where like where before i said you would use a particular word and that would be the feature for a particular column you could use a particular meaning of a word instead and everything else would still work the same way um but you would have a your your word net um which handles semantics for instance would say this is the version of bank uh, which means financial institution. And this is the version of bank which means side of a river. And it would create different features for each of those. So when it, it is a high computational cost because it needs to look at the sentence and the other words. But after it does that, you can still use that as a single token and everything else here still works. Um, that's not built into scikit-learn, but it is in NLTK. Um, so you would use NLTK to do that processing and then send it into Scikit-Learn for classification. Yeah. All right. Two questions? Uh, or? No, that's, that, that was pretty much time. Okay, Sorry. cool. Thank you.